Good to see you, everyone. Let me explain a little bit about our service today. But first, was it last week at the park so special? Wasn't that a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time? <laughs> and, and such has been the kind of like the, the response. Can we do that again, please? Well, let's just say we're working on it and we'll do what we can. There was one special thank you that I did not articulate either at the park or in the grapevine where I just kind of followed it up, which was to say thank you to a wonderful man called Doug. Now, you don't know Doug, but I got to know Doug quite well. He's a member of St. Luke's. And it was Doug who, one day when we were doing Messy Church at St. Luke's, said to me, Richard, I've seen this massive grill for sale. Shall I buy it? And then we can use it for mission and church life and, and everything. And he did, and he bought it. So if you wondered where that huge grill came from, it was Doug. Doug from St. Luke's who freely lent it to us. Uh, I think it cost him a princely sum, let's just say, who brought it over here, who collected it from here. Um, didn't worry whether we cleaned it or not, although we did. So I want to say, and, and Mark, a particular thank you to Doug, because I failed to mention his name uh, last week. So, wonderful. Um, this service today, we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, you may have uh, known two weeks ago, I wasn't here, but for those of you who were, we didn't have any music because Kobe was recovering from COVID. He's doing well, you'll be pleased to know, but he's not quite ready to be here yet. And so we're delighted that Shannon is going to play and sing for us. Uh, as she too is recovering from a broken ankle, she's not quite yet ready to play the organ with all the power required to push through an ankle bone into those pedals, but she will be playing and leading us in our worship and in our singing as well. So all be well, everything you need to know is in the service order. I'll announce everything as we go through. So to begin our time, I had a particular experience on Wednesday evening. We had a confirmation, not confirmation, ordination service in the cathedral. And at that service, a hymn was played at the end that I honestly don't think I've sung in over six years. Maybe it's a British hymn, but it is in our hymnal. It's one of those written by Charles Wesley in the 18th century. And it's a wonderful reminder that we can come to God this morning just as we are. So I don't know how you've come in the door today. I don't know if maybe you're really excited that summer's coming and it stopped raining and that maybe camping is coming for you and it might actually be dry. Maybe you're feeling just plain battered after two years of pandemic. Maybe you're feeling because you've been reading about variants 04 and 05, is this thing ever going to be over? However we've come in the door today, the Lord meets with us just as we are. And so as an opening prayer, I'm going to read the words from this hymn. If I had a decent voice, I would sing it to you. But on the basis that I don't, and I don't want to be alone in the building in 10 seconds time, I'm going to read you the words of, O thou who camest from above. And I offer them as a prayer with which to begin our day. Let us pray. O thou, o, o thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire to impart, kindle a flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart. There, let it for thy glory burn with inextinguishable flame and trembling to its source return in humble prayer and fervent praise. Jesus, confirm my heart's desire to work and speak and think for thee. Still let me guard the holy fire and still stir up thy gift in me. Ready for all thy perfect will, my acts of faith and love repeat, till death by endless mercy seal, and make the sacrifice complete. Father, we come just as we are, and pray that you will send your spirit. 
to work in the hearts of all of us, as you know we need, and that we leave here ready to love and serve you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength to the glory of your name and the furtherance of your kingdom. Amen. So now we turn to our service order and we stand and sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. We remain standing as we pray together. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom all secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and the great commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us and write all these thy laws in our hearts, we beseech thee. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. And let's pray together the collect, the special prayer for today. O Lord, we beseech thee mercifully to hear us, and grant that we, to whom thou hast given a hearty desire to pray, may by thy mighty aid be defended and comforted in all dangers and adversities, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our first reading.
Okay. The first lesson is written in the second book of Kings, chapter 5, beginning in the first verse. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my lord were, were the prophet who is in, Syri in Samaria? He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out, of, out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Far Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a child, and he was clean. Here ends the lesson. Thanks, Melissa. Our next reading is from the Psalms, and this week it's Psalm number 30, that wonderful one. And we're going to do it in the usual way, which is I'm going to say the first, third, the odd numbered verses. If you could please join together in the second, uh, even numbered verses, which are in the bold type. Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, you have brought me up from my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness?
turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. Glory be to the Father and to the Son. Our next hymn picks up the themes of that psalm. We stand and sing together, I worship you, O Lord. We remain standing as Sue brings us our gospel reading for this morning. The Holy Gospel is written in the 10th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, beginning at the first verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house 
eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of Christ. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Let us pray. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass, and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. Amen. It is a time of war. During the 9th century BCE, the nation of Aram was considered the greatest enemy of Israel. And the focus of our first reading is placed on Naaman, one of its leaders. He is described as a big man, a commander, someone with force and power, someone who, surprisingly, the God of Israel had helped to triumph in battle even though Naaman is not an Israelite. But Naaman is not without blemish. Literally, his skin is marred by some unknown rash or disease that the narrator has termed leprosy. But as Naaman enters the scene, and we prepare for a story filled with the mightiest of actors, the narrator suddenly introduces someone very unexpected. He calls her only a little girl, a girl who, during the war, had been captured from Israel and forced to live in Naaman's home, serving his wife. With the ancient world embroiled in political unrest, with war raging, with a powerful man taking center stage, a little girl appears. And just when we think the narrator can't surprise us again, he gives her what is considered to be the most significant role in the biblical narrative. She is the very first character to speak. Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. After these words leave the little girl's mouth, they take on a life of their own. All of the actions of the other characters hinge on them. Her words, spoken to Naaman's unnamed wife, somehow reach Naaman, who then goes to his king, repeats what the girl has said, which prompts his king to send Naaman with a letter to Israel, where he will seek and eventually find healing and faith in Israel's God after interacting with Elisha. Naaman's journey to healing begins not because of human armies and political strength, not because of mighty, powerful men, but because of the words spoken by an unnamed little girl. As we come to this story today, it is intriguing that the narrator chooses to give such an astounding role to a little girl. We are used to stories, especially in the Hebrew scriptures, where it is powerful adults who captivate us. Even this first reading, if we were not paying really close attention, 
we would likely miss the girl and say that it is all about Naaman, some kings, and Elisha. Clearly, though, there is more going on. This girl is playing such an important role, having such a big impact on the plot and on the mightiest of adults and his problem, that we need to question her presence. Really, the narrative could have worked without her. Naaman could have figured out on his own that Elisha could heal him. God could have sent a messenger to Naaman, telling him to go to Elisha. But giving this power of revelation, power to speak the answer to the problem of Naaman's leprosy, to an easily overlooked child, now that is something that is worthy of our attention. That is something that is worthy of a sermon. As a captive of war, this little girl is stuck in a situation that is not of her choosing. Living in a foreign land and household, it is likely that she was yearning to go home. When she learns about Naaman's leprosy, it would have made a lot more sense for her to say absolutely nothing. Surrounded by adults, enemies of Israel, the most reasonable and safest option would have been for her to put her head down, submit to her powerless state, ignore Naaman's leprosy, and work hard in the hopes that her owners would treat her well and eventually allow her some freedom. In fact, saying something was a dangerous move. If her owners disagreed, they could kick her out, treat her poorly, sell her to someone else for being an insolent little brat. However, this girl chooses to respond, and her words, although they seem quite simple, reveal so much about her. So just to remind us what she said, would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. The girl is stating directly that the prophet, who is believed to be acting on God's behalf, with God working through Elisha's actions, will heal Naaman. There is no doubt, there is no questioning or hesitation, just a statement of fact. And this in itself is amazing. This child is not in the best of situations. She is surrounded by war. She has nothing, not even a name. She does not have what our story suggests are signs of strength mighty armies, political power, wealth, and freedom. She is the character we might expect to be consumed by hopelessness, powerlessness, and grief. We might expect that this child would be the first to claim that God is dead, and there is no healing available anywhere because her situation suggests it. But she doesn't say this. She clearly believes that God is alive that God will work through Elisha, even to bring restoration to a man who doesn't know God, a man who doesn't even know that his life has been impacted by God, who is giving him victory in battle. And we can conclude that if she believes that God will act for Naaman's well-being, then she must also believe that God will act for her well-being and that of her people. Although in her situation, hopelessness is expected, her faith in God's activity to, through the prophet is what gives her hope. And with this hope at the core of what she believes, she is able to overcome the danger surrounding her to speak. She knows God is alive, and there really is nothing to fear. God will work for Naaman and will work for her. So she voices this reality to her non-Israelite owners. In so doing, she joins with Elisha, acting as a prophet in her own right. Her words playing a part in leading Naaman from leprosy to health, from non-believer to believer. It is then by having the most vulnerable of characters, a little girl with no name, speak words resounding with faith, that the narrator is clearly showing us the power and value of her faith, elevating it in this story. Her faith is her strength, 
It is what helps her to keep going. It is what helps her to speak in spite of the danger. And it is what helps her to make an impact in her world. Looking at this girl and her faith today, in the context of the 21st century, millennia after this story was initially written and edited, the passage of time does not diminish the importance for us. In each of our lives, there are moments when things feel like they are too much to handle. Like we are, in a way, little children, trying to survive in a world in which we have no control. On both a personal and at times global level, we face violence, war, pandemic, illness, bereavement, suffering, sudden changes that throw everything out of balance, that take us away from our familiar lives, placing us in our own captivity. It is when we face these realities that it is so easy for us to be consumed by hopelessness, powerlessness, and grief. And we could begin to feel like God is dead because our situation suggests it. But the little girl is reminding us today that we must never forget God. God is at work, even if we struggle to see the evidence to support this. Even if horrible events occur again and again, we have got to trust that somewhere amidst the tragedy, God is bringing restoration. God is bringing healing. It is only by holding on to the truth of this that we can move through our own vulnerability by living our lives grounded in our knowledge of the continuous activity of God, we can show the world that the strength to make it through life's hardships comes not from armies, power, and wealth, but from the hope given to us by our faith. I can only speak for myself, but approaching life through the lens of hope in God's activity is the only way that I don't live in a constant state of fear and depression. There is something about moving through life aware of God that makes me feel like there is no reason to give up because there is more to the world than meets the eye. That somehow through suffering, God is present and moving. That hardships will end, leprosy will be cured. And I guess you just never know. Maybe living in this hopeful way could be contagious. Maybe the more we live our lives embracing the truth of God, we can help others to see that truth too. To see that real strength lies in having the ability to see light amidst darkness, joy in the wilderness, restoration in the rubble. During a time of war, when mighty men take center stage, a little girl with no name, away from home, captive in a foreign land, demonstrates her true power when she overcomes her dangerous situation to speak words of faith that impact Naaman's life. This little girl reminds us that when, like her, we confront life's challenges, coming face to face with our own childlike vulnerability, our belief in God's continuous activity can be a source of immense hope and strength, helping us to overcome whatever might be holding us captive. This girl is then truly a prophet and a source of good news for us today. Amen. As we reflect on all that we've heard and prepare our hearts in pr for prayer, we stand together and declare together our understanding of our God and all that has been won for us as expressed in the words of the creed. We say together, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty.
I invite you to stand, to sit, to kneel with whichever is most prayerful for you. But let us pray. Let us pray for Christ's Holy Catholic Church. Let us pray for peace on earth and for the unity of all Christian people. Let us pray for our missionaries at home and abroad. Let us remember before God those of our brethren who have departed this life and are at rest. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church militant here in earth. Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people, we humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our alms and oblations and to receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord and grant that all they that do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. In the worldwide church today, in our, <clears throat> we, we pray for the Anglican Church in Tanzania. In the, in the Diocese of Buye, Burundi, we pray for the priest and people of Gakana Parish. We beseech thee also to lead all nations in the way of righteousness and so to guide and direct thy governors and rulers that thy people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace and grant unto thy servant Elizabeth our queen and to all that are put in authority under her that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. In the world today, we pray for the people of Ukraine who continue to suffer from the ravages of war. We pray for all those who have fled their homes to other parts of Ukraine or other countries. And we give thanks to Almighty God for those who work to care and serve them during their exodus. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, especially to thy servant Stephen, our bishop that they may, both, they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and living word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. In the Canadian Church, we pray for the Diocese of Quebec, the Right Reverend Bruce Myers, Bishop. In our diocese, we pray for the church family of St. Aidan and St. Hilda, Rexburg. We pray that God will bless them in their life together to the praise of his name and the furtherance of his kingdom. We also pray for the Ermanskin Cree Nation, and we acknowledge that we are worshiping on the traditional lands of Treaty 6, including the, tree, the Cree, Blackfoot, Dene, Gros Ventre, Nakota Sioux, and the Soto peoples. We, as citizens of Canada, are also party to this treaty. Prosper, we pray thee, all those who proclaim the gospel of thy kingdom among the nations. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. In our parish, we give thanks for the gifts of God that he has given to us and all those who serve us. This week we pray for our vestry and wardens. We ask for God's blessings on them. We pray for the grace of joy in their ministries to us. We also pray for God's blessing on Alan and Melissa, and we give thanks to God for all their hard work. We pray for God's blessing on them and all who receive their ministry. May our gracious God draw them all closer to him. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all of them who in this transitory life are in trouble 
sorrow, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially those for whom our prayers are desired. Now we pray for those who need healing, and we pray especially for Carol, Mike, Marty, Edith, Whit, Melaine, Brett, Connie, Ryan, Christina, Lindsay, Sue, Sydney, Donna and Clarence, Paddy and family, Ainsley, Carly, Gertrude, Charity, Sheila, Jill, Hoden, Cara, Thomas, Will, Bob, Patricia, Rita, Jolene, Peter, Aggie, Michelle, Ida, Trish, Callista, Douglas, Patrick, and Kyla, Bob, Harold, Bruce, Olive, Cheryl, Zach, Anne, Ailsa, Mary, Michael, Sean and family, Rick, Hilary, Joyce, and Miles. And as we pray, we think and remember especially of Kobe and Mincy. We remember before thee, O Lord, all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, and we bless thy holy name for all who in life and death have glorified thee, beseeching thee to give us grace that rejoicing in their fellowship we may follow their good examples and with them be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. We give thanks today for the, pl for the flowers in the church which are given to the glory of God. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. We continue in prayer on page 11 of our service order. We bring ourselves to God now, just as we are. And we remember the word of scripture of John in his first letter. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, our God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so ye that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours and intend to lead the new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways. Let us draw near with faith as we prepare to take this holy sacrament to our comfort. And so let us make our humble confession to almighty God, meekly kneeling upon our knees. We pray together. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all, we acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honour and glory of thy name. Our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins, to all them that with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing once again now. And our next hymn reflects Luke 10 and just what God can do in all of us, however weak and incapable we feel. We sing, Go to the World.
Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, for ever and ever. All that is in heaven and in earth is thine. All things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. Amen. Again, I invite you to stand, to sit, to kneel, whichever is most prayerful for you. And as we prepare to draw near the Lord's table, we begin with remembering the invitation by our God to come just as we are this morning. Hear what comfortable words our Saviour Christ saith unto all that truly turn to him. Come unto me, all that labour and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hear also what St. Paul saith. This is a true saying, and worthy of all to be received. The Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear also what St. John saith. If anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, And he is the propitiation, the perfect offering for our sins. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, creator and preserver of all things. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and singing. Blessing and glory and thanksgiving be unto thee, almighty God, our heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to take our nature upon him and to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there, by his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And in institute, and in his holy gospel, command us to continue a perpetual memorial of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body, and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, We, thy humble servants, with all thy holy church, remembering the precious death of thy beloved Son, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again in glory, do make before thee in this sacrament of the holy bread of eternal life 
and cup of everlasting salvation, the memorial which he hath commanded. And we entirely desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant, that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And we pray that by the power of thy Holy Spirit, all we who are partakers of this Holy Communion may be fulfilled with thy grace and heavenly benediction. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And we pray together. We do not presume to come to the O Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same God, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy Son, Son Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Sin of the world, mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, mercy upon us. The table is set. We come together just as we are to be renewed in faith and love. Come.
So maybe soon the Common Cup will return, but we're not quite there yet. And so what we've been doing, and we'll do again today, is someone receiving the chalice on our behalf, so that as they drink it, we all remember that Christ's blood was shed for us. Now, I was too slow to get this organised before the service began. Has anybody been lined up for do so? Otherwise, I think I might pick on someone. Shannon, would you like to receive the chalice on our behalf? <laughs> you don't have to put your shoes on, that doesn't matter. <laughs> so the way we'll do this, I'll put this on the rail in front of you. And as I'll say the words then of reception, you don't have to drink it all. And, uh, but as you drink, we all remember Christ's love. And so, Shannon, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for you, preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. And as you drink this, we all remember that Christ's blood was shed for us and are thankful. Amen. And so let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank thee that thou dost graciously feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, assuring us thereby of thy favour and goodness towards us and that we are living members of his mystical body, which is the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs together through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee. And although we are unworthy, Yet we beseech thee to accept this abounding duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offences. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost we all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing God's praise in the words of the Gloria.
So now may the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you and all those you love, wherever they may be, now and always. Can I invite you just to sit down for one moment before our final hymn, which is to ask anyone, are there any announcements that anybody has? I can see Alan is moving, so Alan has something. Thank you, Alan. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, St. John's, the church, for how people came and participated in our prayer vigil uh, last weekend. It was such a joy to see people coming and engaging, praying, listening, and hearing from God. Um, I also want to give a special thank you to John Thompson for organizing pies for the Friday night praise, uh, prayer, and pie. I also want to thank Brian Alt for leading our worship, musical worship in that. Uh, Robin uh, Thompson also did a lot to bring that evening together. And I also want to thank uh, Rhonda for leading signpost prayers during uh, the Saturday and to Robin and Melissa for leading prayers for the children. So if some of these things seem strange to you, some of the stations are still up and around. You can look at them, engage with them, uh, and know that your church is praying with you, alongside you, and that we can continue to pray and ask God to come in the ways that only he can. So thank you for coming out and allowing God to be God. Yes, I couldn't make the Friday night, but the Saturday was just wonderful. So if you've not yet seen the things that are around, please do. The very thing over there, there's the, 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 the shield of faith is just by the glass door as you go out. Please avail yourself of it. They're wonderful things. Everything else you need to know is in the grapevine. I mentioned in that that the work on returning the common cup is underway. If you've got any concerns about that, if you could please catch me at the end and I can take those concerns you have and put them in the pot of how we're seeking to resolve and work this out so that we can restore something and yet do it in a safe way or as safe as we possibly can. Finally, Shannon, thank you so much. It was wonderful. Bless you. Which brings us to our final hymn. Oh, and I meant to say there is coffee available downstairs if you would like some before you go home. We've been reminded this morning just how loved we are and just how our God works in ways we cannot imagine. And so our final hymn is a bit of a commissioning to go and spread this wonderful good news of the God that has found us. We stand and sing, lift high the cross.
And so let us together, in the power of the Spirit and to the praise of his name, depart in peace. In the name of the Lord. Amen.